This is Thursday, June 23rd, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Harold Ekman. Welcome, Harold. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? Uh, October 8th, 1922. And where were you born? This was in Worcester, nearby Worcester, Mass. Mm -hmm. What is your current address? You live in Natick? I live in Natick now. Okay. And what is your marital status? Married. Do you have? 52 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have children? Two, two sons. They're both single. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit of what Worcester was like when you were growing up. Well, Worcester, to my recollection, as it affected me, was a mixed up uh, uh, industrial type city. Many, many factories and workplaces. I lived on the east side of Worcester, which was made up mostly of uh, farm born people, mostly citizens, and their first born children. So we had a lot of rivalry and we had a lot of interaction with the uh, between the children and the parents, with parents trying to learn a new country, mm -hmm. and the children eager to adapt to the new country. Sometimes there were clashes, mm -hmm. but that was my recollection. It was a, a kind of a, a setting where the children would go to work in the factory where the father worked mm -hmm. and maybe look forward to a full a full-time job for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Now here and there were some bright kids who went to college but most of them were the first college graduates in their family mm -hmm. and uh, it was of course needless to say the times were bad mm -hmm. And uh, there was depression that you could see readily on the streets. Mm -hmm. The way of life was was uh, grim mm -hmm. for most people. Tell us a little bit about your parents. Uh, what did your father do for a living? My father was one of those who came over from another country. Mm -hmm. He was trained to be a tailor and uh, he settled in Cincinnati. Eventually he moved east. He inherited a little neighborhood store mm -hmm. that soon went out of business because he inherited all the bills that oh. he didn't know about. Uh, then as time has worsened, he sought odd jobs and he salvaged metals and junk to uh, eke out a living. You asked about my mother? Mm -hmm. She was also immigrant. She learned English readily, did not go to school, but could write her name. Mm -hmm. And that was handy for my father because he wanted some bills on her name. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, she was lame. That was a result of a, of a fire when she was an infant and her mother carried her in the winter and slipped and fell. They both fell mm -hmm. and she had a, a lame leg, mm -hmm. a deformed leg. So. Uh, I, I learned at an early age to look after her and it seems that that has continued mm -hmm. until this day. I, 
I mean, by that I mean, I'm taking, I'm a practically a caregiver for my wife, mm -hmm. and uh, she's she's kind of failing, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, aging. A delicious combination. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, now did you go to school? School in yes. Worcester. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was a high school graduate, high school mm -hmm. of commerce. I was out of high school for two years and I sought to get into a higher education. Mm -hmm. I went up to Clark University and met a biology teacher. Mm -hmm. And I told them about my interest in plants, nature, and an experiment I was doing with uh, sunflower seeds. Mm -hmm. And he listened and he said, why my graduate students don't do this? You ought to get here on a scholarship. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't to be. It was a hard job just getting in because mm -hmm. It was held against me that I went to a, a, a high school at Commerce, which was not exactly a preparatory school for Clark University. Mm -hmm. uh, but they let me in. They let me in on a summer term on trial, and that trial worked out okay. So I was ad admitted in uh, 1942. And this was just after the war we started, right after oh, Pearl Harbor. The war was on. Okay. Uh, do you remember what happened uh, the day Pearl Harbor was attacked? Yes, I, I believe I was, um, I don't remember the ac exact date. Mm -hmm. If you could give me the date. December 7th, 1941? Yeah, that was in the interim. The Mm -hmm. while I was wondering, debating what I could do. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an in-between period for mm -hmm. me. But I heard the radio, I, I heard all the excitement, and I will always remember that Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. when the news first came over the radio. Uh, uh, I knew it meant business. Uh, we were pr we were prepared from the media that we knew things were things were touchy. Mm -hmm. Now, where and when did you enter the military? Now, when I was at Clark University, they, mm -hmm. there were options. We could join a reserve corps for either one of the four services. And I chose the Army Enlisted Reserve Corps. Mm -hmm. That was 1942, mm -hmm. November. So uh, I went to Fort Devens to be uh, processed, accepted, sworn in, and I was in the Army but I was back to school the next day mm -hmm. until the term ended in May. And then I got an invitation to come back to Devons and be processed. You know what that means, haircut, clothing, mm -hmm. only two sizes, too large. <laughs> And, uh, and then wait to be shipped out. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen right away. That took seven weeks. And we, we could not understand what was going on because men were coming in <clears throat> and the troop train were, were going out daily. Mm -hmm. The hold up was because there was a new program that the uh, Army uh, and colleges combined mm -hmm. developed what was called ASTP, 
Army Specialized Training Program. And that was to permit college students to work towards a degree with the object of occupation service for Germany and Japan. And it was a controversial program, but it, it kept the colleges going for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but I first had to have basic infantry training. Mm -hmm. That was part of the prog program. That infantry training took place at Camp Hood, Texas. That's Camp Hood? Camp Hood. Camp Hood. At that time it was Camp Hood. Today it's uh, Fort Hood. Mm -hmm. Camp Hood, Texas, um, June, July, and August mm -hmm. of uh, 43. And what was it like at Fort Hood in June, July, and August of 43? Well, the heat was terrific. Mm -hmm. and, and we, most of the boys were from the northern states and they were hard to get adjusted. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, they ended up changing the working hours. So we had the afternoon off, but we had to go out in the evening uh, on the various programs. During the afternoon, the PX was closed. No, no ice cream, no beer, mm -hmm. no soda, no drinks. We were told that uh, three fellows died from coming in off the hot field, drinking Coke, and so they closed the PX for safety. Wow. Yeah. Now, June, July, and August were the uh, hot month. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about um, your Fort Hood experience you remember? Any people you re may recall? In? Uh, uh, down in Fort Hood, in Texas. Yes, spe special people. Mm -hmm. Well, we were getting acquainted for the first time with fellows from all over the country mm -hmm. and uh, getting to know their habits, their ways of life was, was interesting. Mm -hmm. But I must tell you that Camp Hood at that time was primarily a tank destroyer center mm -hmm. because of the wide open spaces. They could fire weapons and uh, artillery but at the same time, they were suffering high casualties in, in uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. And we were always told that if we don't work out with this basic training, uh, we'd go in the, in the tank, we'd go in the uh, tank destroyers. Mm -hmm. So it was a idle threat, but it, it meant something. Okay. By the way, mm -hmm. part of the basic training was to take aptitude tests mm -hmm. starting at the ninth week. And these aptitude tests were given at night so as not to interfere with the training. Uh, we. Uh, we were offered, at, after the training, uh, aptitude test, we were accepted into this program mm -hmm. uh, in one of three divisions. One was medical, health care, the other was language and foreign service, mm -hmm. and the third one was basic engineering. Now, very few got into the better programs. Mm -hmm. uh, one out of three student, one out of 300 got into the medical program. Mm -hmm. He actually uh, was from Clark and, uh, and I knew him and he became a doctor. 
finally. The Foreign Service people were, were those who were foreign-born and knew a particular language or a country. Mm -hmm. But the bulk was offered basic engineering and uh, I went along with it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to fight it. It sounded better than the infantry. <laughs> so uh, I, I signed on the dotted line. That resulted in uh, going to school, going to college for three months mm -hmm. at the University of Florida. Uh, where in Florida? This is in Gainesville, Florida. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what entails well, we, basic engineering? Yes, we had a classroom. We mm -hmm. marched to classes. We still had hikes training. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, like a West Point setting. Mm -hmm. And this was going on over many colleges throughout the country. But the bad thing was rum were rumors that this program was on shaky ground mm -hmm. and might end. Mm -hmm. Some of the s smarter fellows uh, made their way over to Camp Landing, which was an Air Force mm -hmm. uh, operation. And they signed up, or, uh, applied rather, mm -hmm. to get into the Air Force. Now, I did that too, but I knew my eyesight wasn't wasn't the best. So I I had uh, my roommate, who went the week before. I had him memorize the eye chart for me. Not only did he do that, he memorized both sides in case they switched it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that was interesting. There were, I was with a group of about 30, and we were accepted. Mm -hmm. We got papers to prove it. But, but one of the smart Iraq fellows said, you'll be waving that paper on the, bo on the boat to Europe. <laughs> and his prediction was right. The program ended abruptly. Why did it end abruptly? Because D-Day mm -hmm. uh, and in, in, involved many casualties. Mm -hmm. They had to build up the armed forces in a hurry, especially infantry, artillery, and um, this program of mine um, mostly ended. Some, some levels continued, mm -hmm. but about 135,000 were shipped overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, no, were shipped to uh, what they call line, line companies. Mm -hmm. So my, my destination was Mississippi. Stone the deep Camp south. Ma Camp McCain, Mississippi, mm -hmm. to leave college dormitories spick, spick and span and live in a shack in Mississippi. So it was a great letdown. Mm -hmm. And 15 of us new, newly arrived to this company A that I stayed with the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were resented at first because we had uh, old timers who, who thought they knew everything the way it should be done, and they didn't want the new, the new sassy college guys to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. So little by little, however, we did get better jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this was a division that had been run down. It was a paper division. Mm -hmm. Many of their best men were stolen and transferred to other divisions. 
That was the history we found. But our general, General Malone, Maloney, mm -hmm. uh, kept going to Washington to beef up, beef up his division. He wanted to get into the action. He was a West Point graduate and mm -hmm. wanted to mingle with generals overseas. And so it was very well known that, that he was pushing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the fellows that I came in with uh, got key positions. Mm -hmm. uh, one became a radio man, which was not so good overseas. Another one became a squad leader. Mm -hmm. uh, all 10 or 15 of them got something special to do. And what, what I got was to assist the male guy. Uh, he had a, a, quite a deal going. He, he took care of the mail every day. Mm -hmm. But the company officers said to him, Manny, you, you've got to get some training. You get yourself an assistant, at least for one day a week, mm -hmm. so you can go out and get some training. And he asked me if I wanted to be his assistant, which I said yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I could jump over to where we were overseas, but I would, I would be n missing out on the on the um, finish, how we finished up. Go we right ahead, finish up. <laughs> finish up at Camp McCain, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. The general finally got the attention of Washington. The Under Secretary of War, Patterson, came down to visit the division. We were put, a, we put on a, dis uh, a great um, demonstration for him. Mm -hmm a nighttime demonstration where all the rifles in the division and artillery were firing, firing at an unknown enemy across the fields with tracer bullets. It was very impressive mm -hmm. at night. And the idea was that no enemy could come through that mm -hmm. line. Patterson was impressed. He made the um, division the first to have the expert infantry badge. And that was about $5 a month increase in pay. So, so even before we went overseas, we were, um, you know, indoctrinated that we're pretty, we must be pretty good. Mm -hmm. Should I continue? Uh, when did you go overseas? We went overseas about um, August. That would have been uh, 44. 44? 1944? Yes. Okay. 44. In the meantime, speaking of mail, did you uh, correspond regularly with your family? Oh, yes, almost every day. Mm -hmm. Especially because postage was free. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother was already in the service in, um, in Kentucky, I mm -hmm. think. He was in the S Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your brother's name? Hmm. Your brother's name? Sydney. Sydney, okay. So now you're on your way overseas. Where did you land first? Okay. We left New York on Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. big ship. And we landed in Scotland about five days later. When we were when we got off the ship in Scotland, the uh, Red Cross people were there with a little bag of crumpets, mm -hmm. uh, biscuits, mm -hmm. and coffee. And the Scottish. Scottish band was marching up and down the, mm -hmm. and a lady said to me, a Red Cross lady, 
who was American, but she said, I live, I, I now live in Scotland, but she said, they don't come out every day. You people must be something special. Well, that, that I remember, but I didn't know why we were special. But they played the marching band. That was the royal, mm, the royal, um, whatever. Mm -hmm. so we got on, on trains, mm -hmm. a, group, a group at a time. Uh, the t particular train we were on, the, uh, it was nighttime. They said, you've got to close up all the windows, all the mm -hmm. curtains, no lights. Put on your steel helmets, and if we get attacked by airplanes, mm -hmm. fire. Now, I wonder how you can f fire a rifle when you're in a train and a plane is above. <laughs> but those were the things that were not explained fully. Mm -hmm. However, the train arrived safely, and we got into England about 70 miles west of London mm -hmm. on an estate, a tent city. And uh, they, we were there maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we had additional training. We had uh, uh, experts who had been on the, uh, in the war on the continent. And they, they were telling us how to survive and some of the tricks of not being captured and what to do if you are captured. Um, then when that was over, we were ready to, to go across the ch ch English Channel. Before you cross the channel, the channel. now first, uh, what was your rank at the time? Private. Private, and you were still um, a male orderly, or still assistant. I was still in a in the third platoon. Okay. Yep. Okay, you're crossing the channel. Where do you land? Well, I, I should tell you when in England. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is a uh, <laughs> part of the story. They awarded me a bazooka, and they said, "Hey, you you're a good one to learn the bazooka." One bazooka per uh, not squad per uh, per group. Mm -hmm. I forget some of the terminology, but I went on to learn the bazooka at a firing range, and uh, the shell would explode, but at the other end it was not explosive. So it was a, like a dummy project, projectile, uh -huh. and we fire at a, the target was like a football gridiron, and that was supposed to be a tank. Okay. And I remember I fired this thing, it was like a big stove pipe, mm -hmm. you hold it over your shoulder and fire, and the projectile hit the, hit the, the uh, frame. Uh -huh. The wood, and knocked it over. Okay. And the officer came over and he said, "Oh, that's wonderful. If that were a tank, you would have you would have got it." But I I never had that opportunity. <laughs> Although I felt good, I was now getting to be a a warrior mm -hmm. with rifle, ammunition, grenades, rocket launchers. And now a bazooka, I was uh, unbeat unbeatable. Well, we went across from England, from Southampton, England, to uh, mm -hmm. to France, and and we still came on the beach, Utah Beach, and we had to uh, uh, get off the Liberty ship. Mm -hmm. Just like like they did at D Day, but this was later. This was D plus ninety four. Mm -hmm. 
Some say it was 94 because we were the 94th Division, and the General wanted it that way. Mm -hmm. However, um, we got our feet wet. We had to get off off that boat. Now, and I have to tell you that the Liberty ships, the one we were on, were used during D-Day. Mm -hmm. And there, there were writings on the wall above the bunk uh -huh. that the men from D-Day were their last wishes, their last... Wow. Yeah. And uh, essentially they wrote their name, their mm -hmm. love, their mother, their girlfriend, last wishes, but in a comical and in a, in a, uh, a, a, a real a real way. You could read those and and see the guy who wrote it. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't add anything to it. One reason was there was no more room. But they used all the spaces. Um, and we got to uh, France. We were, uh, we were assigned on the west the coast of France, Brittany. Mm -hmm. Brittany Peninsula. This is where a garrison of Germans fled. Mm -hmm. When the D-Day invasion took place, they didn't all go back to France or Germany. Some went to the coast cities of Saint um, Saint Nazaire, Lorient, and Brest. Um, now there were big battles to take Brest, but it was so costly. The military didn't pursue anymore. They said, just let's contain that. Mm -hmm. So there were 30, 50, 50 to 60,000 uh, enemy in port cities. Mm -hmm. And we had, our division had a 450 mile area to cover. Now, this was the first, first taste of uh, artillery live fire, mm -hmm. run for your life, <laughs> they, they, uh, the very first day, day we were there, we, uh, we had a, a, a welcoming s ceremony. And I was, I was doing, I was like delivering a message. I was at the battalion headquarters, mm -hmm. and uh, the officer there got hold of me, and I didn't even know that he knew where I was from. But he said to me, "When you get back, tell Captain Haggett that on the first night there's usually a, an attack." Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> I, I was a little jittery to bring that kind of news, but even before before I got back to the company, the artillery started to come in, mm -hmm. and uh, that that was the day our first man got killed. He was the smallest fellow in the mm -hmm. company, but he was gathering some wood for building up his uh, foxhole. Mm -hmm. You know, we made foxholes and then we tried to put a roof over them. And he, he was looking for wood and materials and uh, he got killed. Three got injured. Mm -hmm. uh, now the men were starting to get worried because Manny, the male guy, was uh, taking off, disappearing. I won't say the first day, but in, in time, we were there for an extended period of time, from September to uh, December. Mm -hmm. During that time, 
we we could go to local villages mm -hmm. at night. And Manny had a habit of staying out all night, more than uh, more than often. And the men were worried. We're not getting our mail. We want to write. We want our mail to go out. We want to get letters from home. Mm -hmm. So Captain Haggard called me and he said, no, you're the assistant, but I want you to take over. Mm -hmm. And I want you to give Manny your job. So I had to teach him how to run the, the bazooka. I think he threw it away. Oh, he did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wouldn't carry. Mm -hmm. Very few men would want to carry something like mm -hmm. that around. But I became his uh, successor. That was an increase in uh, rank to mm -hmm. corporal, uh, what they called technician, fifth grade. But it was equivalent to corporal. Mm -hmm. And a little pay raise as well. So that went along. We were at the f what was called the Forgotten War. Mm -hmm until around the middle of December, the big uh, breakthrough, mm -hmm. the German breakthrough, which later became called the Battle of the Bulge. We heard about it, mm -hmm. and the end of, see this one, I think December 16th or 19th, mm -hmm. By the end of December, we were on our way, packing up and putting those 40 and 8 box cars mm -hmm. for a, a ride across France to, uh, to the German, to the Western Front. Now, some interesting things happened along the way. Mm -hmm. I, I think of them every day, but I can't, I can't take out today and tomorrow here. Um, the second officer in command said to me, he said, uh, I'm going to have more to do than censor letters. I want you to take this stamp. And, and read the letters. You know who, who, who was going to squeal and say the wrong thing. Scan their letters, stamp the letters, and sign the officer's name. Wow! I did that. Yeah, that was quite a, quite a daring thing for him to do. But he said, "I'm, I'm going to have more to do than, mm -hmm. than read letters." So uh, that's what I did. So you were actually doing more than delivering, you were censoring. I was, I was censoring the letters. Wow. But, um, that came, that ended when things quieted down finally, he mm -hmm. said to me, uh, he said, I'll, I'll take back that stamp now. Mm -hmm. the, the men have nothing to do. The officers have time now to mm -hmm. do this. Um, but there were, that, that was it. My, mm -hmm. my object was to get, to do whatever I had to do mm -hmm. and whatever was required. Sometimes I was doing uh, 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 running messages, sometimes I was with the, uh, the front line group. Mm -hmm. But I was not in third platoon anymore. I mm -hmm. was in the uh, what they call uh, the company headquarters platoon, and that was, you know, you could you were interchangeable at the at the whim of the um, the officers in charge. So I had a, a varied experience, mm -hmm. but we would typically would move ten miles, five miles a day. And then at night, uh, at dusk, it would be time to go look for the regiment and get our mail, because the mm -hmm. mail was delivered to the regiment, mm -hmm. no further than that. And somebody from each company had to go get the mail. 
So we developed a system that the uh, four people, A, a B, C, D company, and company, uh, headquarters company, five men would try to get together mm -hmm. when it was quiet enough to, to beg, borrow, or steal the jeep mm -hmm. and go find, look for a regiment. So we get back after after dark many times. Mm -hmm. Men would read their mail by flashlights under the blankets, and I I had to know where everybody was. Um, I knew where some not so uh, good things. We had 43 killed, missing in action, and also, of course, now we were on the Siegfried Line and the mm -hmm. West Wall. We were in Germany, and casualties, new men coming in mm -hmm. often, and Keep, I was able to keep track of it and uh, account, account for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, that was it. Mm -hmm. The story kind of ends there. Mm -hmm. After that was waiting to get out. Mm -hmm. But the same officer I, I talk about came to us and said, now we're going to get home, we're going to have a 30-day furlough, we're going to get some more training, and then we're going to go to Japan. So that was our, um, our um, des dessert. Okay, so now that brings us to early 1945? A, a, the, the winter of 1945, okay. 44 and 45, mm -hmm. was the worst, of course, mm -hmm. the worst possible. Um, I understand the you. War, the, the war in Europe, I think, was over in May. It was. May. We did. Oh, in, as an infantry division, there was a great, we joined other infantry divisions and mm -hmm. Third Army, we were now with General Patton, and uh, it was a matter of uh, pushing ahead, mm -hmm. and our, our division did pretty good, led the way, as, as they say. Mm -hmm. And we crossed the Rhine River mm -hmm. um, in March, March of uh, along with other divisions. Then we had the uh, occupation work in mm -hmm. in the uh, Rhine area, Dusseldorf, mm -hmm. Krefeld. After that. We were we left Patton's army and we did occupation work in Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. I think I think Patton uh, Patton's army did go to Czechoslovakia too, mm -hmm. but we ended up doing some occupation work until we built up enough credits mm -hmm. to uh, points to get out of to be discharged. Okay, so, so you I, were still mail orderly. I was until mm -hmm. right, right until that. Do Do you remember? Uh, um, and um, mm -hmm. there were so many interwoven stories I can't go into. Mm -hmm. uh, I I adopted a, a dog uh, in Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. We were marching along this road one time, and this. 
beautiful uh, Scotty mm -hmm. dogs started following us, and I took a tr I attracted mm -hmm. that dog. It was a, w a female puppy, a female dog was mm -hmm. going to have puppies. So I took her in, and she had five puppies. And um, when they were older, I gave the puppies away to uh, local people, mm -hmm. except one that I kept and wanted to take home. Mm -hmm. And they would not allow me to take Aww. the dog on the ship. Mm -hmm. So we're marching at the port La Havre, France, mm -hmm. to get onto our boat. It was an Italian ship called the Volcania. Mm -hmm. And another group of men were coming in from another ship. And one of them came up by to pat the puppy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, would you like to take him? Would you take care of him? And so I left, I left the puppy with him in good hands, mm -hmm. I hope. Uh, so we, we got home, and it, it's uh, coincidental, coincidental that on a New Year's Day, mm -hmm. we left the Forgotten War to go to the real war. Mm -hmm. And on a New Year's Day, I uh, also got on a boat to go home. Mm -hmm. So that was a nice touch. Mm -hmm. So where were you? Um, where were you discharged? We got to New York City, mm -hmm. and the big boat was out there to greet us. Unlike uh, Vietnam, there was a band playing, and, mm -hmm. and uh, again, Red Cross, coffee, cookies. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Camp Shanks, which was a processing center. Mm -hmm. And from there, a train to back to Camp Devons, Fort Devons. Mm -hmm. And then processing at Fort Devons took a two or three days. I was so anxious to get out that the little, little fellow at the typewriter was um, typing my discharge paper and left out all kind of things, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was important at that time. You know, uh, 30 years later, your, your predecessor, mm -hmm. Mac McGilvery, straightened all that out and he got my discharge paper mm -hmm. corrected. Not the original, but an addition mm -hmm. to put onto it. Um, so I wanted to become a civilian and, and, and resume and go back to school, mm -hmm. which I did. And then, then I could go on and on and on. Okay, I know time is limited. Okay, that's okay. Uh, so you go, we, you went back to Clark University. Yes, I did. And you did graduate. I graduated. And what was your degree? B.A. Bachelor, Bachelor of Arts. In what was your major? Well, that was something I didn't want. I wanted, I still wanted the health field. Mm -hmm. And that was not, not the right college for that field. Mm -hmm. So I took sociology, uh -huh. but attached to sociology was economics. And I didn't like that. But oh. that was a degree, sociology okay. and mm -hmm. economics. And what did you do after the war? Then the, what everybody else did was to hunt for a job. Okay. They were not plentiful. Mm -hmm. And what could a man from the infantry do? Become a policeman, become a, mm -hmm. a watchman? Those things did not appeal to me. Um, so I kicked around and tried a number of jobs. 
But we enter into another chapter, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll have enough time mm -hmm. for that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and in the meantime, you met someone who will be your wife? Not right away. Not right away, okay. That took until I was 35. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. And I finally met somebody who had background similar mm -hmm. to mine. She graduated Salem State Teachers College and had a, a life as a secretary. Mm -hmm. um, how I finally got a job could be interesting. Go right ahead. Well, at the Clark University, I graduated, mm -hmm. but I was not happy. I still had some credits left, so I took some courses at BU. Mm -hmm. And what did I take? I looked back, and my hobby was taking pictures, photography. So I took um, random courses and uh, visual, visual aids. Um, visual aids and uh, media, media mm -hmm. type of job. Right. That um, eventually, from meeting some fellows there, I, f I found out that one was working right home in Worcester. Mm -hmm. Worcester had a TV station at that time called Channel 14, a UHF station. Mm -hmm. So I, I, called, um, I called up and they said, you want to talk to Cy, he's the film director. Well, Cy was a classmate at BU. Mm -hmm. And I went up to see Cy and he said, oh, he said, I, I need somebody part-time here, that's all we can afford. But I wouldn't want to offer you that. And I said, why not? Why not? Because uh, I like that, mm -hmm. working with film. Yeah. yeah. You know, they they didn't use videotape at the, in mm -hmm. those days. It was all 16 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. I, was, I also had another part-time job. So the two of them together was worthwhile. Well, <coughs> within three weeks, Sai <coughs> himself moved on to become a producer, and I got his job <laughs> in three weeks, mm -hmm. and I was there two years, mm -hmm. and that station ran into trouble, trouble and went out of business. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I had made some contacts with Channel 4 in Boston. Mm -hmm. And there was a job open there. But I was able, lucky, I finished one job on Friday. Uh -huh. And on Monday I was working in Boston. Wow, so you were there the early days of television. Yeah. So I had, to, I had to commute from Worcester to Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two years. Mm -hmm. Then a new channel opened up, five. Yeah. And I went over there. Now, what was your job then, a film editor? Film or? editing. Okay. Yeah. And I stayed there for 30 years. Wow. So, uh, counting the three TV stations, mm -hmm. I had 35 years of the same work, mm -hmm. and that was something unusual because before that, I had about 15 different little jobs. <laughs> and I'd go from one job to another as long as it was a better pay, mm -hmm. a better conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, oh, you, you didn't ask me this, but no. after I got out of the service, I stayed away from from military units, mm -hmm. uh, veterans groups. I wanted just to be a civilian. Right. 
And but slowly I got back, and my own division had a, a uh, mm -hmm. New England chapter. Mm -hmm. I joined that and became very active in that. I joined some local organizations here. Mm -hmm. A little, little bit. I'm still reserved about it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm particularly reserved about the policies of uh, of uh, military groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, I come, what, I'm kind of an independent okay. thinker. So what were some of the other organizations you joined? Uh, my own division still has a newspaper okay. after all these years. Mm -hmm. They still have re national reunions. Mm -hmm. The last one was... Um, down south somewhere, mm -hmm. and it might be the last one, they haven't decided yet. Mm -hmm. The division will still exist as a, um, uh, like the daughters of the American Revolution, they, mm -hmm. they set up a, um, a, a, a unit mm -hmm. of relatives particularly sons of the veterans of the 94th. Mm -hmm. So they will inherit the, the prestige and the honor and the mm -hmm. history. And they're doing a pretty good job of it so far. Mm -hmm. I think the alliance it's called, and I think there might be as many members in the alliance as there are survivors of the uh, division itself. Mm -hmm. We don't know, but when it's down about 200, they plan to end the division mm -hmm. and, uh, and switch over to the alliance. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about you attaining the French Legion of Honor. Did you go to France to? In, in about I think 50 years after D-Day, mm -hmm. France had a ceremony, and it was printed in our newspaper, our division newspaper, mm -hmm. that uh, American servicemen present at this at this uh, ceremony would get a, a medal, but that others who could not be present, could, could uh, write and request one, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I did. Eventually I got a reply that they ran out of medals, but instead they issued us a diploma. Mm -hmm. So I got a pretty thing at home from the French Embassy in Boston, and it was a, essentially a diploma, thank you for your service in World War II, and was signed by the Consul mm -hmm. General, and I thought that was it. It was mm -hmm. another memento. But from that, the French Embassy uh, was looking for Americans who served in France in World War II, and they got my name, rank, and serial number from that paper, mm -hmm. and I got a letter that I was going to be um, given um, this medal, medal of uh, Legion of Honor. Mm -hmm. um, so that took place in Boston in July of um, 210. Mm -hmm. Completely unexpected, complete surprise, but a, a pretty gold and green Mm -hmm. Red metal pinned right here, mm -hmm. and the ceremony was uh, was held at the Institute of Contemporary Art on the waterfront in Boston. It was on Bastille Day, mm -hmm. so they had about th three hundred guests, mm -hmm. and the, the guests were there. To, to, to honor several things that were happening at once. One was a new f 
French television service. Uh, another was uh, Bastille Day itself. Mm -hmm. And there were other groups, I cannot remember, but they were all invited upstairs in a large auditorium. And they had to stand, no seats. And we were, four, four men mm -hmm. were scheduled that day, and I was one of them. Um, so that was, I, I, I could not refuse that offer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a very nice ceremony. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's get back to your family. You said you had two sons. Did either of them serve in the military? No, mm -hmm. no. They're, um, they were, one lives at home with us now. Mm -hmm. The other one has his own little uh, place in the uh, Framingham. Mm -hmm. So. And how long have you lived in Natick? How long have I lived in Natick? Mm -hmm. Over 50 years. So you were also in Natick just when the population started booming. Yes, I remember. I remember going down to the what was a White Ham down on the Bay, uh, Bacon Street. Bacon, mm -hmm. yeah. The White Ham, and uh, people would hitchhike for a ride to Natick Center. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that today. And today you see a whiz, uh, on a steady line of automobiles. Mm -hmm. um, as w as one of the uh, veterans said. The big change in Natick, more traffic, mm -hmm. and it's more building. Mm -hmm. While I was commuting from Worcester to Boston for my job, and somebody said, why don't you look around Framingham or Natick uh, for a house? Because during the time I worked, in Boston, my father passed away, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was taking care of my mother. And I thought a little, a little place in Natick, a Framingham, would be good. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, I ended up on a, on a Gibbs Street, but then later moved to Beacon Street. Mm -hmm. So I saw the old and the new, mm. and that's. What happens when you live long enough? You see, the new becomes old mm -hmm. from another generation, and then when you get to be my age, eighty-eight, mm -hmm. you can get mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> what age am I in? Mm. Prehistoric, a future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Harold, is there anything you would like to add for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Yeah, yes, I think of this often, mm -hmm. very often. When I had to read letters, I, I particularly read every word of, um, of this fellow, this fellow who was killed in the afternoon, and he had written a letter in the morning. Mm -hmm. I picked it up, and now I wanted to know what did he say in his last words. It was a letter to his sister, and he said to her, I want to point out two things, that war is hell, and two, teach your children to hate war. And uh, and I I, um, I went over to his uh, officer, um, platoon platoon officer, lieutenant, and I showed him the letter. And he said, "Why didn't it go out?" I said, "He just wrote it this morning." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Well." I'll take it, and I'll write a letter t 
to his sister. But I always remembered his advice, and this is advice forever. Yeah. Well, Harold Hate Ackman. war. Hate war. Mm -hmm. Harold Ackman, we thank you so much for participating in the Veterans Oral History Project. I thank you for having me. Thank you.